What number are you on? I got, I guess I got off the Galatians 16. Yeah, we're on question number 16, Galatians 600. Uh, yeah, she's fine. She could get it. All right, so how are we supposed to admonish a, a fellow Christian? That's Admonish means to correct, to chastise gently, uh, to point out a fault. How are we supposed to, to handle that? And what kind of spirit? Meekness, which means humbleness, which means gentle, right? How successful are you going to be if you go to somebody that's in a fault and you talk down to them or you talk with an arrogant attitude? You're not going to get very far, is it? You're going to turn them off and push them away and make it worse. Now notice there's a line drawn here between fault and sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though you're not sinning, he says a fault. Can you tell me the difference? <coughs> Is that when the wife says it's your fault? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. No, she's going to blame you. Let's put, let's put right there. Well, you better not respond in an arrogant attitude. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Steph told me when I first met, I've got a, I like, I like Dave, I've got a wonderful, great wife. The one thing she told me when I first met her, she said, you can ask me anything and I'll do it for you. But don't ever tell me I have to do anything. Don't ever what? That's a good advice. She said, you can ask me anything and I'll probably do it for you, but don't ever tell me I have to do anything. So basically, it's true, her choice and respect. That's what it boils down to anyway. I think the fault instead of sin is maybe like people who have fallen away from church or, well, you know, I guess so, yeah. So you want to elaborate on it? You got us all confused now. It's your fault. It says wrongdoing. So it doesn't. Would it always be Well, I just think there's a difference because sin is defined. To know you're good and do it not to the end of the sin. So a fault is you didn't know better. So you correct that person. Yeah, but what if you know better? Well, then it's sin. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Does Roger have any faults? Now, would you want me to say you're in church and lie <laughs> We don't have a whole lot of time like that, do we? Well, I didn't mean to take it up all the time. There has to be a difference. Yes. A fault and sin. Right? It's like ignorant and stupid. <laughs> well, stupid implies that you can't be taught, and ignorance is you just have no knowledge about the subject. Yeah, 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 that you can learn about it. I made her to be a brain surgeon. I don't want to do it. Let, let, me just, let me sum this up. In the spiritual realm, in the fellowship, there's things that people do, whether it be the pastor or, or officers of the church, that they don't sin, but there's a learning process. And you correct the incorrect. You correct the things that, well, maybe you shouldn't have said it. Or maybe you shouldn't have gone there. You see what I mean? And someone, and there's a lot of things that are just makes you better, better Christian as you learn. Sanctification, progressive sanctification. Right, right. So it's not that you sin, but you learn. We learn as we go. I learn a lot from my mistakes. Bless you by your mistakes. Right. Okay. I said last week we tried to teach our kids not to make it, but sometimes we're doing on them anyway. But if you didn't teach them, it's your fault. That's right. I got a warning. Right. So you taught them right. Whether if they do wrong, willfully knowing, then they sin. But if you taught them right, but if you don't teach them, a lot of times, and I'm going to let you hang the lesson, but I'm going to say this. The parents used to tell the children. Now, I hear more of the children tell on the parents. Yeah. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Steph and I will see kids at the store sometimes and the way they talk to their parents like that. I'm dead with a mash my mouth my mom and I'm going to cross the room. I mean, I don't know. I would never have to go to out to town ever again. You would have been at the house.
house pulling corn the rest of your life. Yeah. My mom, now she'd go to see it. She'd go to jail now, but. My, hey, that's my, another thing. My mom, if I was acting up in the store, she didn't care. She'd take back to the apartment, sit down the big chair, and pull my britches to the ground, bare butt and all, and wear them out in the front store. That's a twin more embarrassing than the punishment. I don't, don't want to get my butt so the public anymore. <laughs> it's embarrassing. She didn't care. She would wear me out. Oh, so that was you. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. So I went wrong. I need to put my name <laughs> And now there's no repercussions for behavior. Right. I mean, respect respect is learned at the home with the parents. If the kids grow up with no respect for the parents, not respect any authority outside the home. And that's what we got today. Look at the district. Hey, no respect for the law, no respect for teachers, no respect for any of this. That's why the world is in shape of It is. I want to tell you back when I was hey, you did not back talk on the dad. Nope. That was a rule you didn't go by. Are you saying police yeah. officer? Yes, sir, no, sir. Now the kids are just getting last order. Yeah. We found them all the way, so a lot of people have. <clears throat> okay, let's go to Romans 12, 3 through 5. What point is this scripture trying to get across? It's maybe in verses 3 through 5 for me. What's well, that? The grace of the grace of the Just on this recently, recently, about one accord and being many members and being one. So, what's the, the moral of the story here? What points it trying to get across here? We really well, we're all important, right? We're all on the same team. No one's no higher than anyone else. No respective right. person. Exactly. We're all equal in a body. I mean, does the Bible not say, you know, your foot's important, and you miss your foot, you're going to notice it, right? So all members work together in one team or one unit, in one court, as Greg Woods talked here the other day. So, you know, there's no big eyes and no little youths. We're all in together. We all, none of us could pick our parents, right? Nobody could pick the country we live in. Uh, everybody, everybody that's saved had to repent, didn't they? Everybody, whose blood was he saved by? Jesus. Jesus' blood. And he makes intercession to the Father for us, right? We all had to repent, ask forgiveness for our sin, didn't we? We all got saved the same way. There's nobody, no big eyes, no little news. You know what they say about being important? Take a bucket of water, fill that bucket up with water. Stick your hand in that bucket of water and pull it out. The void that is left in that bucket of water is how important you are. What? The void that is left in the bucket after you pour your hand out of that bucket of water, that's how important you are. And you're not at all, right? We're all important. People are very, very important, important to others. They turn to them for uh, guidance or help or, or just, you know, learning or whatever it's been. but the thing is you can't be important to yourself others you may be important to others but you don't look at yourself as important and we talked last week about uh, God resists the proud and um, well I'm getting myself here um, you put yourself on the pedestal you gotta kick it out under it yeah. and you do it in a heartbeat all right, so let's, uh, let's go to 18 here, Matthew 23, 12. What's the Bible say will happen to someone that exalts himself? And exalt means to lift up. And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. All right, so what's, uh, what's abased mean? Humble. 
But I basically need the word humble. That's right. That's exactly right. So, somebody that exalts herself, what's the Bible saying going to happen to them? God's going to humble like you. That's right. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't like humble pie too much. It don't taste very good. Yeah. So, now, if you think about it, let's uh, think of the devil. No, let's go back. If you want to turn or you can, I'll read it. Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. I heard a preacher preach this this week. I thought I got that in the lesson. We read this before, but think of all the personal pronouns here. This is the devil. For thou hast said, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I, I, I. Our last we talk about eyes in the middle of sin, eyes in the middle of pride. That's his downfall. So, <clears throat> now, um, and that's one thing about Toyota too that I had to be real careful during my interview because, you know, a lot of times you go for an interview, you're supposed to kind of brag on yourself, right? I mean, they want to make sure you're hiring a good candidate so you, know, you want to talk about good things. But somebody that I knew got a job there and he told me, he said, Toyota is team oriented. Don't use personal programs. Programs. He used the word we or team or us. He said, they don't want to hear I. So I'm glad they kind of told me that because I could talk about my achievements and I'd have to tie it to like, you know, we done this at the last job I worked called we done this or whatever. I had to rephrase it. I couldn't get no credit to myself. This was a good thing. But uh, I thought that was kind of interesting and it paid off. I got hired, so thank God for it. Okay, now, um, just take a few minutes. I want to go over um, I want to go over a few stories in the Bible and we'll kind of sum them up. I read a little bit of scripture. Uh, some people in the Bible have a problem with pride. I want you to tell me what happened to them. Maybe why. And brother, I love brother boys comment on this last week. Kind of cracked in. So I want to read this. You don't have to turn if you don't want to. It's Acts 12, 21 through 23. And it reads, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed or dressed in his royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration or speech unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, Is this the voice of a God and not of a man? And immediately an angel of the Lord smote him, or struck him, because he gave not God the glory, and was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. So what did he fail to do? He failed to give God the credit. Now he's calling him a God, and he didn't say nothing different. You can actually have pride and keep your mouth shut sometimes. In this case, he did say a thing, and got him. And then he struck, of course, he was struck dead. Uh, brother Will, I say, come fishing, bait. Yeah. You know, you think about Moses. He failed to give God credit. That's what he'd have to do. You know, we seem to have a lot of the water for Yeah. I think got Moses in trouble a few times. He could see it. Yeah, he was disobeyed. Okay, here's another one. This is a... I won't read all this, but if you want to know where it's at, it's in 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 23. Now this is uh, uh, Uzziah, and I'll read a verse here to start with. But when he was strong, uh, he was strong, this is, he was a strong leader. His heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went to the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Whose job was that? To burn incense in the altar. Temple. Priest. 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 So he went in there and just took by himself, I'm going to burn incense. He just put himself that high above the priest. He didn't want to do it. Well, one of the... Uh, Azariah, the priest, went in and took, it says four score others, well, scores 20. So they took 80 others with him, 
And they chased him like, hey, you can't do this. You gotta get out of here. You can't do this. Verse 19 said, Uzziah, then Uzziah was wroth. He was mad. He didn't like it. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even arose upon his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So he was struck with leprosy right on the spot in the temple. Didn't Saul do something like that too? He got a himself and get the priest. Yeah, he didn't wait for the prophet to do the sacrifice when he went in the battle. He just took it to South Dan said. And that cost him too. That's another. There's a, there's a lot of them in the Bible once you really start thinking about how pride got in people's way and become their downfall. In verse 21, it says, And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. So he had to come down out. They actually thrust him out, but once he got leprosy, they got him out there and thrust him out. Uh, another story, um, and I may teach on this sometime. I mean, most of us know the story of Esther, but it's kind of comical in a way because you think of Haman. Haman got promoted, he promoted Haman to be the head prince, I used to say. He, what's that? I said right. I don't know where you're going. And uh, so, you know, he was he was revered among the people, and people bowed before him except for Mordecai. And the Jew Mordecai would not bow. You know, he's a Jew. I'm going to bow in the name of God. And, you know, Haman and was like, hey, what's up <laughs> here? You know, he, he people pride, and he did. So he was so enraged, he thought, I'm just going to have all the Jews wiped out. I'll take care of Haman, or I'll take care of Mordecai, and I'll take care of all the others while I'm at. So he came up with this idea, he's going to trick the king and give him permission to kill all the Jews, and he did. And the king gave him his ring, and what they used the ring for is a seal or something, a legal document, and that was as good as the king did himself. And he got a decree made that he's going to kill all the Jews. So anyway, as time went on, uh, uh, Mordecai found out about his scheme and he showed up outside the gate and trying to summon us up real quick. And he showed up outside the gate, so I called from ashes, and Ashes was like, kind of like, see more what's going on, what's he doing? Because when they do that, that shows the stress or mourning or repentance, so she wanted to know what was going on through her. <coughs> so she sent somebody to find out. He sent her back like, hey, he's going to kill the Jews. You need to intercede on, intercede on our behalf. And she's like, you see, Esther made a humble statement here in a way. She said, I can't do that. You can only preach a king if you're something or you can get killed. That's the law. And she didn't think, well, I'm his wife. All of us march in there. You know, she didn't take that prideful attitude. She's like, I can't just approach a king out of bounds. And well, so uh, hey, uh, Mordecai sent word back, like, "Hey, you're not going to get out of this either. So we'll come back to get you too." So here again, she had a humble request. She said, "Well, you guys, do, y'all pray for me. Y'all fast and pray three days, and me and my uh, what they call handmaidens will do the same thing." So there's another humble approach. So anyway. Um, when she approached the king, the king says, what do you want, Esther? I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Because he knew he trusted her. He knew she wouldn't have a powerful attitude, he wouldn't take advantage of it. She said, you and uh, Haman come to a banquet I've already prepared. She already prepared. Oh, yeah. Look at the Bible. Come to a banquet I've prepared for you too. Well, you know, of course, more, or, uh, Haman thought, man, I could get there with the king and the queen. They just didn't have her, you know. So his head swelled some more, you know. So anyway, uh, they went to the banquet, and the king asked Esther again, what do you want? And she says, come to the banquet again tomorrow with Haman, and I'll tell you. So Haman's head was really getting big. He went home. Of course, on his way home, he seen Mordecai again. Of course, he didn't bow and made him mad, but he just kept his mouth shut this time. So he went home and told his wife, hey, you know, I got invited to the dinner again, you know, and I've had this many kids and I've done this, I'm rich and blah, blah, blah. And his head swelled. Well, it's kind of funny about it. That night the king couldn't sleep that night. And he wanted the books, Chronicles, brought to him and read. 
And he found out that Mordecai actually saved his life before there was conspiracy to kill him. He's like, what do we do to honor this guy? Nothing. He's like, ah, that ain't right. So when, uh, so he got uh, Haman in there. He said, Haman, how do I show honor that somehow I delight him? Here Haman, thinking himself, boy, oh, yeah. Haman just ordered it up. I'm going to read that part. He said, uh, right here, it's in Esther 6, 8, 9. Let the royal apparel be brought which the king used to wear, and the horse that the king ride upon, and a crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of the one's king's most noble princess, that they may array the man with all whom the king delays to honor, and bring him on horseback through the city, streets of the city, and proclaim before him. This shall it be done to the man whom the king delight to honor. See, he thought he was talking about him. He said, okay, do, do it to Mordecai. Boy, talking about eating some humble pie. He was able to swell in this day and said, okay, do it to Mordecai. He, he hated He just wanted to kill him. He's actually on his way that day to say, can I, I want to hang him on the gallows I built. He could keep it high. And yet he had to do that. I think it's hilarious. How God will turn things around on you. So, uh, you know, he got, he got a big base of humble pie, that's for sure. And then when, he, when his wife found out later what happened, she said, you're in trouble now. And he was. All of them. They went back to the banquet that night. Uh, Esther spilled the beans on him. Big time. And the king hung him, hung him on his own gallows. She was a beautiful woman. She must have been just gorgeous. That's right. The Bible describes mm -hmm. uh, Now, I was thinking, 50 cubits high. I think it's about a foot and a half. So you think about 75 foot tall. You don't need something 75 foot tall to hang something like that. Why do you think he wanted to build so tall for it? Hey, well, he wanted to sing from long distance away. Right, right. This is an example. If you don't honor me, respect me, this is what I'm going to hang to you. Okay. Yep. So. Yeah, you've heard it saying sometimes our, 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 our own worst enemy. Well, he was that time. Okay, uh, let me do one more real quick here. Uh, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, now, he had a dream, and he couldn't figure out what, what happened. Why, why he dreamed this? He didn't understand the interpretation of it. And when the magicians and the astrologers and stuff get interpreted, it made him mad. He says, he wouldn't tell me anything about the dream. He said, you, well, you're going to tell me everything. I said, well, we can't do that. Nobody can do that. So he said, I'm going to have y'all cut pieces. I'm going to kill y'all. So my, my heart said, Danny, when he found what was going on, he went to him and said, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret your dream. But here's a, a Danny will give a humble response. But the king asked him, can you interpret my dream? And he said, I'm fine here. This is in Daniel 2, 27, 28. When Nebuchadnezzar asked him if he interpreted the dream, Daniel answered very humbly. He said, Daniel answered in his presence to the king and said, Thy secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, and musicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven, and there are secrets. He didn't say, Yeah, I can do it. Got your cover, I can do it. He said, There's a God in heaven, and there's a secret. Give credit to God. I thought that's pretty cool. That's a humble response. How many times do we take credit for stuff that we shouldn't really? <laughs> but anyway, I thought it's kind of ironic that when he done this, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar sang high praises. He said in 247, says, The king answered to Daniel, the truth, it is. Your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou can reveal his secrets. So I mean, he's like, God's the man. He was building up, right? And that connection had a problem with pride. So he had another dream. And Daniel interpreted it to him again. And he warned him, like, hey, you need to make you need to make some changes or you're gonna be you're gonna be sorry. You're gonna be driven out in the beast of the field, you're gonna eat grass for seven years, you know. And right. 
And uh, so, believe it or not, 12 months later, he was in his, it says, uh, right here, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the king of Babylon. The king spoke and said, Isn't this not the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the mighty power of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So he was bragging on himself, right? Boastful again. The same hour the thing was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar was greater for men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. So he got he got humbled, didn't he? And after seven years, his understanding came back to him. Now, there's we talked about ego several times in this lesson, and there's a little uh, uh, oh, what's the word? When you take initials of something. Acronym, right? Thank you. I had a blank. I don't need it in. I like how you probably make any mistakes. Anyway, you take ego, edging God out. Edging God out. Think about that. When you're so full of pride, God ain't got no room in there. He doesn't edge him out. King Nebuchadnezzar repeatedly was shown the power of God. I mean, he even had Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego thrown in the fire, right? Because he, they didn't bow to his image that he built, the old image he built. And he bragged on them again. Uh, let's see here. I don't have any quick to go to, but he was bragging about God again. I will say this, I thought it was interesting about the, the, the fiery ferns. I didn't know this. They said the fiery furnace, you know, of course he was mad and didn't bow down. He actually gave him another chance. He said, what I hear is true. And he said, I'm gonna give you another chance. And they still didn't bow, so he threw him in the fiery furnace seven times hotter than it normally was. To the point it killed the men and threw them in. And then the you know, king went down there and told him, come on out. Well, what do you mean, come on? You know, how do you come out of it? Well, I understand it was actually in the pit. And they actually had like stairs going down to it. And you know, when the fire wasn't in there, they'd go down there and clean it out or whatever. So when they they had they could come out. Of course, you know, it normally you throw somebody in there instantly dead, you know. But they walked around there and come on up out of there. And let's go to the last one here. If you want to get a pencil, when I get done to this next question, I want to give you some things to think about to ask yourself. And my yellow vest of this a little bit of pride in me. I made a big list. And uh, I'll, I'll go over here in just a minute. If you can get a pencil ready, you might write these down. Anyway, it's got a Malachi 4 1, Old Testament. What is to be the fate of the proud? Malachi 4 1. So I'll read that. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubborn. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall all leave them to the root of the earth. That's scary, ain't it? Mm -hmm. They burned up, tell the story. All right, so some things I ask yourself, and I've asked myself these questions, and I've thought, oh, okay, that hurts a little bit. So I think everybody, if they're honest with themselves, some of these are going to step on your toes a little bit. And I'm not here to cast stones because it's, it's coming up to me too. Do we have an attitude of independence? I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. Yeah. It's always about me. Are you self-centered? Have you made yourself a God? Do we have an attitude of ungratefulness? Do we think, I hurt myself. I deserve it. Do we become really irritated when somebody tells us we're wrong? Do we ever admit we make mistakes? I know a couple of ladies in my that I've known that are perfect. They've never made a mistake. As my daughter and my mother-in-law. I love her to death. And she never, she never made a mistake. She, she made a comment one day. She was wrong and she knew she was wrong. And her answer was, it is today. <laughs> she was she was so humble, but I mean she was 
She was Dorcas to the letter of the law, letter of the Bible. Very hospitable, super good Christian lady, but never a mistake. <laughs> All right, did we refuse to listen from counsel of others? We refuse to listen to someone else who's trying to give us some counsel. And here's what's going to hurt a little bit. When you're in an argument, do you really try to solve the issue, or you are, or are you more interested in winning? Does it become a battle of ego sometimes? I just tell her to calm down. He said, he just tells her to calm down. It always works for, for me. Try that with the redheads. <laughs> yeah, you know, he knows how it works. Do you always have to have the last word? Oh. And there's some people always has to have the last word. Do you have a habit of interrupting people before they're done talking? I do not. Do you constantly criticize other people? Do you always have to be in control? Now here's one that I never really thought about. I thought, okay. Do you ask God when you pray to keep you humble? Think about that statement. If you're asking to keep you humble, you're already saying, I'm humble already. And I thought, ouch. God, help me to be, help me to be humble. Help me to be more humble. <laughs> so I thought, hmm. Never thought about it quite that way. Humble is one of these things you can never claim you have or you've done lost. Kind of wrong. If you say I'm humble, that's a proud statement. Right. Well, what do they call oxymoron thing? Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, remember the warning signs in the Bible about pride. You don't want it to trick you. It, 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 you don't want God to humble you. I hope you got something out of lesson. I know I, I sure got my two step on myself, state it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. This is my home. Oh. All right, I think I'm ready. Number 12. Are you ready? Yep. My Lord, what a Okay, start it again. <laughs> it's going to be hard to get his voice not to come through. It's it's well, not, we know it's going to come through. She said it'll make her sound better. Okay. Yeah, I just want to be soft. It's about the same. What? Fine. It's fine. Sure, cute little thing. <laughs> If you can't get it, David, it's okay. Well, hold on. I got something else going on now. Okay. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a
just a matter, that's just a minor little thing. She just took a bite of a piece of fruit. But think of what that fruit meant, what it represented. Think about Cain and Abel. I think about Cain and Abel. Cain, he, or Abel, he brought to Cain, and Cain brought their offering to God, and God accepted Cain and Abel. It was his first thing. He was a fan of his fruit, of, of, his, of his animals and stuff. It was the, the the blood. He, he brought that. He brought accepted that. He looked at Cain and said, you know, Cain, you know, I, I don't really object to all this. Well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen right then when God says, well, you know, this is not what I want. This is not what I want today. Would you be angry? Of course you would. Your feelings would be hurt. Our little feelings get hurt. And we're angry and we're mad. So what does he do? He slays Abel. Slays Abel. And he, he, he killed him. Now think about how angry we would have to be to want to kill someone. Have you ever been angry enough that you felt like you wanted to kill somebody? I'm pretty mad sometimes. I don't know about to kill him, but I've been pretty mad. <laughs> but you think about that in just, just over, uh, over something that we, we think everything to us is it's the most important thing in the world, what, what we have. But we think about what does, what does everyone else gain from that? And I, and I think about Cain often, and I think about how angry he must have been. And he, put, he said, you're, you're just cast out. You're out into the world. He said, they'll kill me. So he puts a mark on him that people won't hurt him. That they, and we think about that. How would you like to go around with a, with a mark on your forehead just to protect you? Let's think about Noah. I always think about Noah. Noah's sitting up under a tree. He's all rare by rest and taking it easy. God comes to us and puts him out in our You know. And he tells him how big it's got to be. 
and you think about, and I think about what Noah would think. And what would you do? What would you do if, if, if God come to you and said, I want you to build an ark? What would you do? What would you think? And I thought, and I thought about how much faith Noah had to have for him to build that ark. And I, right. And you, but you think about that when, he, when he's building that ark. And, and, and God's telling him, you know, look, I'm going to destroy this world. And all that's going to be left is you and your sons and your wives. And, and we think about that. That's, that's going to populate the world. With just those three people. Then we got up, went on a little farther and I got thinking about Abraham. And I think about God, Abraham when I down the column said, I'm going to destroy God and Gomorrah. I'm just going to tear, I'm going to tear, I'm going to burn it up. I'm going to just do away with it. They, they, they're evil. They, they've done all the things they shouldn't do. So I'm just going to destroy them. What would you do? What would you do? If you know that God, and you said, you looked over to God and you said, well, how about if there's 50 people, 50 righteous people? Oh, you know, 45. No, 40, 35. Couldn't find five righteous people. Think about that. In a whole country, he couldn't find. But Abraham done what he thought was right. He tried to save that city, but he failed. And he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And I thought about Lot. And I, and I thought about Lot when he told him, he said, Look, you got to leave. We're going to destroy this city. But, but you have to take your wife and your daughter with you. You have to go. Well, Lot didn't want to go, but he went. And you think about Lot, what, what does the one thing that they told him not to do? Now, you can do anything you want to do, but you got to get out of here, but you can't look back. Well, I think as Christians this morning, when we start looking back, that's when we, we're in trouble. But oh, Lot, God kept me, and he told us, don't look back. And what did his wife do? She looked back. And she paid the price. She turned her into a pillar of salt. Then we'll get back to Abraham again. Abraham was, this verse, uh, as I read this verse here, I thought about Abraham's first son that he had by a bondwoman. But God told him to take his son, his precious son that he loved the most. His, he called his firstborn son. And, and you think about that a lot. He really was his second son, but he was born. He was born out of what I, what I say to love. Isaac. And he said, I want you to take him. I want you to sacrifice him. So he loads up his mule and he puts his wood on it. He takes his men with him and they go and they get so far. He says, okay, I want you to stop. You guys wait here on me and, and we've got to go make this offering to God. Sacrifice. So he takes the wood and he gives it to Isaac. Isaac's carrying the wood for his own sacrifice. Think about that this morning. And Isaac's asking Dad, you know, where's, where's our sacrifice? What, you know, what would God will provide us a sacrifice? Well, he gets there and he builds the fire. He gets it ready. And he, he puts Cain on the fire. But the name goes home. He drew his faith. He checked his faith. Do you ever get your faith checked? He checked Abraham's faith right there to see if Abraham would do it. I can see me now if God would come to me and say, Butch, I want you to take Billy and put him on a pile of wood and destroy him. I can see me now what I would have to go through. Because Abraham had faith that he knew that God would provide him a sacrifice, and he did. He gave him, him an animal sacrifice. Think about how much faith that is this morning. <laughs> now let's go to Joseph. Joseph was the youngest of Israel's kids, his children. Joseph loved him the most. He was his favorite kid. And any of us got a favorite kid here this morning that we love more than none other? I love my boys. I just do. Abby's ever pretty high on the life dream. But she's not my son. <laughs> but you think about it. Bear with me, I'm sorry. 
I, th I think about Joseph and, and I think about his brothers and they said, hey, look, we got, we got, we, I, we don't like him. None of us like him. He's got ten brothers and none of them like him, so we're just going to destroy him. So what do they do? They, let, they plot back up this big thing. We're going to, this is what we're going to do. Joseph, his dad made him, Israel made him a coat of many collars. We've all heard uh, Dolly Parton sing the coat of many collars. Well, he made him a coat, and they was jealous of that coat. Now, you think about that today. If we come in here in church with a coat on that red, black, green, all the different comments on it, people just kind of look at you. But he was proud of that coat. He was really proud of it. And you think that them boys were jealous. So we're going to do yeah. something. We're going to do away with him. So they come up to this spot. We're just going to take his coat. We'll put some animal blood. We'll put blood on him. We'll put him in a pit. We'll often leave him and let him die. Well, his brother, they, 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 they all stopped this. And Ruben said, hey, look, we can't do this. We can't do this. We can't, we can't do that. We'll just take him up out of there. We'll sell him for his real It's real life. Yeah, that's <laughs> We'll sell it. We'll just, we'll just sell him. We'll take him down into Egypt, and we'll be done with him. What happened to him? He fell into God's plan when he went into Egypt. Right. You think about that. He fell into his plan. He was going to work his plan. And you think about, I think about Moses when he was in Egypt, and, and he was brought up with, with, just think of the riches and the, the schooling and, and all the benefits that he had. But he still loved his people. He still loved the Israeli people. But he killed one of them, one, one of the guards for being mean to one of the others. And, and, and he's, he's well, I'm just going to walk. I've got to go. They'll, they'll kill me. So he's in, he's in the mountains. He's got his sheep over on the side of the mountain. He's a herder. I won't be in all those names, but he's a herder. He's taking care of these sheep and he's walking along. He sees this bush of burning. You think about this bush out there burning, there's nothing around. We've got a boy to see the Why is this bush not burning away? It just keeps burning. An angel told him, you know, just what's all about it. What was the one God come to him and said, look, go back to Egypt. I want you to go back and I want you to go before the Pharaoh. I want you to plead for my people. Now I want you to think about this. Suppose you today had to go before the Pharaoh or, or we'll say President Biden, we'll say bad as that is. They have to go before him and, and talk to him for a, for a group of people and he, that he could care less about. And the Pharaoh, that's the way the Pharaoh, he didn't care about the Israeli people. They were their slaves. But he went back and he'd done what Jesus wanted him to do. But what, what would you have done? Would you have done what God asked you to do? You know, we, we think these are minor little things that, that we read as we go through our Bible each and every time we open our Bible and read and study. But I want you to look, when, you, when you're reading your Bible, when you're thinking about the things that you see in the Bible, you kind of put yourself there and just think, well, what would I do? What would I do in a situation like that? But old Ruben saved him, didn't he? I can't do anything without the notes. I'm sorry. I, I forget names. I just do it. But here I want to go on over to 1 Samuel. <clears throat> Suppose you were you were Samuel. And, I, and before I get to Samuel, I want to go back up. I want to go to Hannah. Hannah was Samuel's mother. And, and Hannah... She couldn't bear children. She couldn't have children. So they go to the temple. He, uh, her husband goes to burn the incense in the temple. And he gets there and, and she's in the temple. And he comes out and he gives them all a good, you know, something to eat. Kind of, I would say, like a picnic. We would say in our day. And he comes out there and, and he gives her her. And she, she, start, she goes into the temple and she starts praying. And she's praying so hard that they think, Dude, she's drunk. But she's asking God. She said, if you'll give me one male child, I'll make it be human service to you as the, when he's old enough to go forward. Now, I want you to think about that. If you're as mothers, which I must tell you here are mothers this morning, and you think about, well, I'm going to give my son up 
to do this work. This is what he's going to do. Think about that. What, what, how proud you'd be. I often think about how my grandmother, uh, my mom, she was, she was different. She had named this dog. I was talking to her this morning. I didn't know what my name was. I went in the Army. She had some names for me. <laughs> We're good. But you think about that and, and, and how proud a mother would be of their son to go into the, to the service of, of, of the Lord, of, to, to serve God. And then I got to thinking about uh, Ruth. And I thought about Ruth. You know, Ruth is one of the minor uh, chapters in the Bible. You don't, there's not a whole lot in there. But you think about Ruth. She married her mother-in-law and had two sons, and they married, and mother-in-law's husband died. Her husband died, her friends died, her friend's husband died, and at the time she said, Ruth, she said, just going back home, I don't have, I don't have any, there's, I won't have any more children. The time I have another child, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be too old, and just one. But Ruth was faithful, and she said, no, no, I'm going to stay with you. She's following God's plan. She said, I'm going to stay with you. What does Ruth do? She goes out and she does just what, what her mother-in-law tells her to do. Go out and work in the fields. Do this. Go and lay it at the, the, the king's feet or the, the, the owner's feet. I, like I say, I have trouble with names. I'm sorry. And, but what did she do? She married him. And what came from that marriage? Think about what came from that marriage when Ruth got married. King David. Think about David. Come if Ruth would have said, I, I don't want to marry. I don't want to. I was going to go back to my home. Look ahead. Look ahead. As Christians, we have to look ahead. Look for what we're going to, we're going to get one day. Then I thought about Esther. I loved it when we started talking about Esther this morning. You, and I think about Haman and how uh, he, how proud he was of himself, and he was going to do all this stuff. But oh, Esther, she found out about his plan. You know, she said, "Nah, she said, no, he's not. Uh, I'm going to stand up." So Haman was going to kill. He won't kill. He wouldn't kill just just the one. He will kill all the Jews, and that would have included Esther too, because she was her. Esther's right. Esther. She was a Jew also. But she, she came up with a plan. It was like Douglas said back then, no matter if you was the king's wife, it didn't matter who you were. You didn't go to the king unless he asked you to come before him. So she had to have she had to come up with a plan that she could could, could get to the king and make all this do. And you look, it took her twice, but she done it. She done what she had to do. And she saved the Israeli people. Now we think about that, just a little gesture that she done because a man was going to kill all the Jews. That's the three prominent women in the Old Testament. And we throw Saul. I think about Samuel when God told him that he was going to meet Saul and how he, how he was going to be, how Saul would be. Saul was like a head taller than everybody else. And he must have been a handsome man and but God told him, he said, this is one of my people have asked for a people. They, they want a captain of the Israeli people. And he told him, he said, you'll meet this man. And when you meet this man, he, he described how he would go about it, how he would meet him. But then I think about Saul. Saul was chosen by God. So, you know, he had to be a good person. He had to be a good God-fearing person in order to be chosen by God. But what happens... When, when you start getting above your raising, is what I'll say. We start we start thinking about the, all the different things that Saul done as, as he went through his kingship. Well, I'll say all the different uh, that. He, but he done so many things that he got in with that he did shouldn't have done, and he got he got so bad that he said, "Look, the, your sons are going to die, and you're going to die." And what happened? His sons were all killed. He wanted his armor bearer to kill him. He said, no. He said, I won't kill you. I can't kill you. He said, I can't kill you. I can't kill you. Can't kill you. He said, well, you can't let these, these infidels he, he do this to me. So what does he do? He took the sword out and he killed himself. He fell upon his sword. 
And his armor bearer did the same thing after he had killed himself. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. It, it's like I can't get over the, the, the thing about being important because sometimes we get to thinking we're important. Don't, don't, you know, we're all important. We're all, no matter what. And God has a plan for us. Each and every one of us that sits in this room this morning, He has a plan for us. But it is our choice to follow His plan. <coughs> I thought about David. David, by reference, was a was a little old fellow. wasn't very tall, wasn't very uh, muscular, we'll say. Just a tiny little fellow. And he goes out to fight a giant. Now, if you're a little old fellow and you're going to go out to fight a giant, are you going to take a rock and a sling with you? You know, that's like taking a gun to a knife for you. <laughs> you think about that this morning, though. But David went out before that giant, and he slew him. He took a stone, such as little smooth stones in a sling, and he slew the giant. And I think about all the things that, that King David did, especially if you go back with Saul when, and you go through it. But I think about David, and, and the biggest thing I think about David is when she was... <laughs> yeah. I want to say bird, we'll say bad. <laughs> but you think about what he done. He saw her. He started taking a bath. And he goes out and, and he, he, he wants that. He wants to marry her. He, he wants her. He wants her bad. So what's he do? He takes her up, sit right on the front line of the battle where he knows he's going to be killed so he can have her. Well, he has her. She has a child. What happens to that child? Dies. Dies. Think about that. All the sins that we pay, we make, we're going to pay for our sins, no matter what. We have to, we have to, he, you know, he tells us, everything, you know, all our sins are passed away. And it's always think about worry. I, I'm not much of a worrier. I just kind of go along and take things as they come. We can't do nothing about what happened yesterday. We can kind of control today. But why worry about tomorrow? We can't control tomorrow. Think about it this morning. We can't control tomorrow. But David, <coughs> David was a great king. David wanted to build the temple for God, but he couldn't build the temple because he had blood on his hands. Now you think think about that little simple thing as well as God like David. He had blood on his hands. But but in God's plan, he came up with, with an answer. Come up with King Solomon. Think about Solomon. Did you ever think about Solomon and David? Solomon, by reference, was David's youngest son. But he could build that temple. And, and, I, and I think about Solomon. How, what a great person he must have been. Because he, when, when God chose him to be over his people, he said, you know, what, what do you desire? What, you know, what do you want to... Uh, you know, I'll give you what, what you need. And we think about, well, we always say the word wisdom. You can give me wisdom. You ask him for an understanding heart. And I always think about the heart because I think if we have good thoughts, they come from the heart. But he asked him for an understanding heart. And God told him, he said, well, you, know, you ask for this. I'm going to give you this. He said, you know, you, you have asked for, you know, I'm just a child. And you just ask for wisdom. You just ask to be smart. You want to know how to, how to take care of the people and, and how to do how to do all the different things. He said, I'm going to give you, got to look here. Riches and, <laughs> riches and honor. So he gives Solomon everything he could want. And I thought about King Solomon, and as you first start reading about Solomon, and, and, and the, the thing that will come to all of his mind first is when the two women have brought the baby, one that's laid over on the other, and, and it's died, and two women are claiming the same baby, and they bring it to Solomon, and they say, this is my baby, this is my baby, they're arguing, 
What's the almond? What's the almond do? Give you a sword. So I'll just cut it in half and we'll give you both. No, 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 don't do that. You let her have it. That's the mother. That's the mother there. And Solomon knows but that's because he had wisdom. He knows that. <coughs> I want to get over. I'm going to go to the New Testament a little bit now. And I want you to think about Simon, Simon James, Andrew said him, said, I'd say they was set in the boat and they was, they was mending their nets and Jesus walks by and says, come on, follow me. What would you do? You know, this stranger walks up and says, hey, Wesley, come follow me, come with me. What would you do? Just think about the plan that Jesus Christ, that God had for us. Think about that. It, they know We've got to follow him. We've got to follow him. Uh, and, and I think about all the disciples and all the different things that they were doing. And what if, what if you just would have said, "No, nah, I can't go. I've got to stay here." We have decisions. We have choices. We have to be careful. Make sure we make the right choice. And then I got to thinking about, I think about Judas. God knows who's going to betray. Jesus knows who's going to betray. I'm sorry. But he, he, he was his disciple. And I tried to reference 30 grains <coughs> of silver that he betrayed Jesus for. And if you think about 30 pieces of silver, I really we couldn't really find a definite how much that was in the days. Money, but back then I would assume it was a lot. But then you think about I think about all that, that, he, that Judas had done. He betrayed him with the kiss, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. But what did he finally do? He took that silver back. Oh, he gave it back. I don't want this. I can't, I don't, I don't want it to take it. What did they do with the money once they bought it back? I'll use today's terms. They bought a graveyard with that money. We think about that this morning. And what did he do? He went and killed himself. We've got to be careful. We've got to be so careful in this world. We've got to be that little light, what I like to say. And I thought about, I thought about a lot of things as I was reading and studying this, and I really did. And, and I thought about Simon. It might be See, there's, there's a Simon and a Simeon, and I always get those two mixed up. That's why I don't like to use word names. But, but I thought about they was they had crucified. They were they had beat Jesus, and and I always think uh, about how bad they had beat him, and how how down he must have been, and, and now they're wanting him to carry his cross. And in my mind, Jesus wasn't able to carry his cross. But he said, Simon, to carry his cross for me. Just think if, if you had been Simon walking down the street and they said, hey, come, I want you to carry this cross. What would you do? What would you have done? Would you have carried his cross? <coughs> yes. We think we would today. But back then, when they're, they just walk out there and say, you know, I don't know this man. Why should I carry his cross? We think think about that, but see, it's a plan. It's a plan. It's it's a plan. He, he's gonna. He's got. He's providing the way. I would have carried it just because he was weak and weak and he needed help. Even if I didn't know who he was. Wow. A lot of hard people in this world. Hard people in this world. We've been out to talk about people a lot of times about how hard some people can be, and there's people that care less about anything but themselves. Sometimes they don't care about themselves. Excuse me, I'm sorry. But then I went over and I thought about Jesus being on the cross. And I, and I thought, he, he never said much. He never tried to not be put on the cross. He, he done just what he was supposed to do. But what's the, one of the things he did when he was on the cross? He forgive us sin. And we think about that. And I think about Jesus on the cross. And I think about when they pierced his side. 
and blood and water came forth. And I think about that blood. That blood is what washes away our sins today Amen. that he buried on the cross for each and every one of us. Think about that blood that comes forth. That washed away our sins. He could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't have to die on that cross. But he died for me. He died for each and every one of us here this morning. No matter what we think, he died for us. He bled for us on that old cross. <clears throat> you know, we think about all the things that we that we should do, and we, we try to try to be. I try to be a good person, as we all do. I look for the goal of eternal life. That is my goal: is one day to walk in the garden. Boy, don't that song just tear you up? Just walk in the garden. Can you imagine just walking in the garden with Jesus Christ this morning? What it would be. How you would feel. How high and happy you would be. Think about that one day we can walk through that garden with him. He'll let us walk through that garden. And all he asks of us is a reasonable service. Sure. Just a reasonable service. He don't ask us to do all kinds of different things in this old world. And I'll close one little verse that I just absolutely love with all my heart. In Ephesians 4, chapter 32nd verse, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave Christ, say, hath forgiven us. He's forgiven us for our sin. All we have to ask is do is ask him. Anyone here this morning that that doesn't know Jesus Christ. The altar's always open. The altar's always open. We'll come to the altar with any of you that need to come. Always remember, he just asks a reasonable service. And if you're not right with Jesus this morning, if you need to come and pray, if you need, whatever you need to do, we'll, we'll help you in any way we can. I'll do anything I can to help you as we will. Danny, David, any of us here, the altar will help you. Will help you if you need help. Does anybody have anything you'd like to say? <coughs>